Chapter 4 So now I told Satin everything that happened and I gave her the big ruby ring with instructions to go get the remaining $5,000 I was still owed from the nephew. I told her to tell him that I knew everything about the incest and about the change in her will to give the church half of her estate. I said she needed to tell him that unless I got my money, I would use that information against him and that she was not to give the ring until I was fully paid. This asshole nephew turned around and told Satin that because his aunt died of natural causes and because I didn't rape her or make it look like a robbery, he wasn't going to pay me the rest of the money. As far as he knew, all I did was find her already dead and just took the ring off her finger. That I was just trying to collect for a job that I didn't even finish. He did want the ring though and offered her $1,000 for it. Satin already had instructions not to give him the ring until he gave her the remaining five grand. When Satin refused to give him the ring and warned him against not paying me, the nephew threatened her and me. He basically told her to tell me, shut up punk, kick rocks, you ain't getting shit. And just like he had hired me, he could hire a real hitman to kill her and me and Satin's two sons if we didn't shut up and get lost. When Satin told me all of this, she expected me to get angry and to go into his store and start shooting and killing him and his bodyguard driver. She was surprised I was so calm and I said, okay, I figured as much. Let's just wait here in the parking lot for him to close up and then we'll follow him. We waited, or as we waited, she asked me what I was going to do. I told her, I'm gonna do what I told you in the beginning. When you first approached me with this contract, that I probably have to do. I'm gonna kill him and leave no witnesses. She looked at me with a new respect and a little fear, and she asked me, what about me? Are you gonna kill me too? I played the part of this experienced killer hitman I had been playing from the beginning with her, and I answered her, I should, but won't. Not yet anyway. Not as long as I can trust you. Can I trust you? Of course you can. How could you even ask me that after all this? I'm getting burned in all this too by him, she said. How are you getting burned too, I asked her. That's when she confessed to me for the first time that she had jacked the original price of the contract to 15000 instead of the ten grand I had agreed to. When he gave her the first half, he actually gave her 7500 of which she had kept 2500 I have to take care of my two sons, don't I, she said. I laughed and told her I figured she got more for setting all this up. You knew, she asked. It's what I would have done in your place, I answered, acting more mature and professional about it than I actually was. She leaned over in the car seat, kissed me, and told me, I'm with you. Let's make this son of a bitch pay. We waited, and we followed him to an apartment complex and watched as he left his bodyguard driver in the car waiting for him. He went into an upstairs apartment and a young woman met him at the door. She kissed him and let him in the apartment, Satin said. He always did like them young and dumb with big tits and a lot of ass. This pretty much described the girl who greeted him at the door. He stayed in the apartment for a little over an hour, then left. We followed him to his home. He lived in a secure complex. We followed him for two more weeks, getting his routine down. We observed that he visited this girl twice a week, and each time he never stayed over an hour. His bodyguard always waited down the street in the car for him. I decided that this is where I was gonna get him. One night, when he went to see his girlfriend, I found my spot beneath an open stairwell that he walked up and down on his visits to go see her. It was dark beneath the stairwell so I was able to hide there unseen. My original plan was just to shoot him in his back through the stairs as he walked down the pavement below. I had sat and parked directly across the street from where I was, where I could see her and she could watch the apartment door. She was supposed to signal me when she saw him coming out of the apartment. She would do this by lighting her cigarette lighter in the dark. Once she lights her lighter, I'll see it from my hiding place under the stairwell. If he isn't alone when she leaves or if the bodyguard shows up or if anyone else is around, she would hit the car horn one quick time to warn me to call off the whole thing. But if she lights the cigarette lighter twice, it's a go. I remember it was cold out that night and there was a bright full moon in the night sky. 
A light drizzle of soft rain had begun to sprinkle softly. I thought of how this old woman had died in my arms, of all the sick shit this bastard had wanted me to do to her before killing her. I thought of how he had told me to kick rocks and that how he would hire a real hitman and not some punk little kid like me if I didn't just shut up and go away. The more I thought of these things, the more I thought that shooting him in the back wasn't going to be what I wanted. Although shooting him in the back as he came down the stairs would have ensured a quick getaway. I didn't care about that anymore as I stood there in the damp darkness beneath the stairwell. It was personal now, so I wanted to see him face to face and to know that it was me killing him. Satin had warned me that he always carried a 32 revolver in the back of his waist like I wore mine and to be careful. I waited for Satin to give the signal, then I saw it. The lighter flicked once and then two flicks. It was now or never as he came down the stairs. As he stepped down onto the pavement, I met him with my gun drawn. He was startled, and as soon as he recognized that it was me, he started offering the money. He was telling me that he was sorry he had burned me, and how he was rich and how he could give me more money than I had ever had before in my life. I told him to shut up. I didn't want any noise. I took a quick look around to make sure no one was watching, and then I told him, you should have waited for her to just die. You knew how bad her heart was. You set me up and used me. Then you have the nerve to threaten me and disrespect me. That's when he told me he had to do that because she told him that she wanted him to change her will to give half to the church. He had no choice but to kill her before she could finalize the will. He would now make it all up to me. He always intended to pay me the rest of the money he owed me. He said, here kid, I got money. Let me pay you off. And he started to reach for his back pocket like he was going for his wallet. I remember Satin's last words to me about being careful because he always carried a gun in the back of his waistband underneath his coat. I fired my first shot, hitting him in the chest. He fell over backwards. I stood over him as he cried. You shot me, you shot me. I was only going to pay you. I was getting my wallet out to pay you and you shot me. I have the money in my wallet. He tried to reach underneath himself again. And as he was going for his wallet... But I stepped on his arm and pointed the gun towards his heart. I told him, you keep your money, take it with you to hell. And I squeezed off two more shots, killing him dead. I looked around again to see if the gunshots had alarmed any of the neighbors or his bodyguard driver. But it was strangely quiet. I thought to make it look like a robbery gone bad. So I emptied his pockets, which were full of cash. And I took his jewelry. He had gold chains and a watch, and I saw that 32 revolver fall out of his waistband, and I realized this bastard had no intention of paying me. He was in fact reaching for his gun when I shot him both times. I took his wallet and his gun, then I reached in my pocket and took out that big ruby ring I had taken from his aunt. I shoved it in his dead hand, and I told his dead corpse, contract fulfilled. I thought about his bodyguard driver then. I walked down the street to where he was parked in the car, waiting as usual. So at first, I thought I would have to kill him too, so I went down. He was sitting there listening to music and smoking a joint, rocking out like everything's all good, you know, with the windows down too. So I just leaned in with the gun, put it to his temple and told him, if I ever see you again, if I even smell you or think of you, I'm gonna kill you. I didn't kill him, I should have. But there had been enough death already. I didn't need another ghost to haunt my soul. He never turned around. He never saw my face. He sat there frozen, afraid to move. I left and he disappeared. He never said anything to the police. Nothing. He just disappeared. He didn't even come back. He was gone. He just got ghosts because that's what I told him to do. So now, I felt better. I felt like I had got revenge, you know, for the old lady and for me. I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody, but I just felt better after I killed him. That's a bad thing to say. I would come to learn later on that killing people was not as much fun as I thought it would be. Maybe that's why I didn't kill the bodyguard driver. I wasn't a hitman after all. I was just an idiot who grew up believing the Hollywood version of what a hitman was supposed to be. Until the reality of it all actually hit me later on. I wanted to grow up to be the best hitman there was. Sadly, my first kill was not anything, and it was an accident. He wasn't, though, so I had my first kill after all. 
I had the money. He ended up having 9000 on him. And his jewelry was worth a lot too. While we drove to Satin's house, she had a lot of questions about what happened, how it went, and where I went when I left the apartment complex. She said she lost sight of me. I explained to her about going after the bodyguard driver and what I did. How he never saw my face or me. How he was driving away as I told him to do. And as I was walking back to where she was waiting. She wanted to know why I didn't just kill him too. I told her, nobody paid me to kill him. I don't kill for free. Still trying to sound like some actor in a movie playing it cool with her. When we got back to her house, we went into her bedroom and I took everything out of my pockets that I had taken from the nephew. I took it all out and threw it on the bed, even the 32 revolver. She looked at me and she asked me, what about me? Are you gonna kill me someday because I was a witness? I sat her down on the bed and I told her, I don't know, maybe someday I might have to kill you if you ever do me wrong, but no, it won't be because of any of this. This is the life I've chosen. And if it's with you by my side for however long it lasts, I don't know this either. Only time will tell. But from now on, you don't ever withhold anything from me like you did by jacking the contract fee. You don't ever lie to me. And you give me wings to do whatever I feel like I have to do. If you're loyal to me, and I don't mean with sex, you can fuck whomever you want. I mean loyalty in all of our business affairs. I know you saw me. You know the potential in me. You thought you would put a pistol in my hands and you'd be able to control me. This is why I never had sex with you until the other day. I never had sex with you because I knew how you worked and how you used that body and that beauty of yours to manipulate and control men. Believe me, it's been really hard to resist you when you're always naked around me in that see-through baby doll. I wanted you to know that with me, that wouldn't work. She laughed at that and admitted that since she'd met me, she'd done everything possible to try to seduce me. Like I had just said, that the other day when we finally did have sex, she had to trick me into it. That while the sex was great, she knew it was only because we were both like professional prize fighters, trying to use our bodies and the sex to outfuck each other. This was not what she wanted either. I said, good. Now we have an honest understanding of each other. And here, there's 9,000 here in cash. Here's the other 2,500 this guy owed you for your share of the original contract. The jewelry she can keep her dump. I didn't like having a dead man's jewelry on me. I was superstitious about it. She asked if she could keep the revolver because it was originally hers before she sold it to him a couple years ago. I told her to keep it. We sat there quiet for a moment. I asked her to make me a drink, a strong one, and to roll me a joint. She seemed to sense what I needed. I was gonna try to get drunk and smoke away all the emotions I was still reeling with from just committing this first murder. She began to clear the bed of everything and told me, I know what you need. Just trust me, as she reached under the bed and pulled out her stash tray. She usually kept her rolling papers and weed on it. This time, there was also powdered cocaine and powdered heroin. She said she knew I would be a little on edge after the night's events. So she got some for us to do together to help me take away what I was feeling. I told her no, just a drink and a joint should do. But she told me to just trust her and that she would still fix my drink and roll my joint. I needed to do this, what she called a speedball. It would relax my nerves and help me. Besides, she didn't want me to get all drunk and useless and pass out on her. She had plans for tonight, for us to celebrate our first kill together. And for this, she wanted me wide awake and functioning. I said, sex, really? I don't think I can even perform after tonight, I'm sorry. She just told me to relax and to put myself in her care. She knew what I needed and she handed me my drink and lit my joint for me. A couple tokes later, and a few sips on the vodka and orange juice, I began to relax a little more. She locked the bedroom door and began to undress me. I was still telling her I didn't think I'd be able to perform tonight when she made me snort a mixture of powdered cocaine and heroin, saying the whole time, just trust me, daddy. This was the first time she'd ever called me daddy. As the warmth and rush of the speedball mixed with vodka and weed, it began to rush through my body and my senses. She had me undressed in my boxers on her bed. Then she did a strip tease in front of me like she had performed so many times in the strip joints. Her name was on the marquee 